Bendición. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation on how healthcare organizations can keep patients safe from critical equipment breakdown. My name is uh, Jim Burke, and I'm a senior risk consultant in the Risk Services Division of Hub International. The webinar is being hosted by both uh, Hub International and the CNA Insurance Company. Equipment breakdown is a topic of concern for all healthcare organizations and professionals, and a response to a downgrade or loss of essential or critical equipment begins long before any precipitating events occurs. Those are the things we're going to talk about in today's webinar. A little bit about Hub. Hub is a global insurance brokerage firm. We provide a broad array of insurance and risk management products and services, and we are dedicated to helping businesses and individuals evaluate and manage risks and their insurance needs. We have over 250 offices and over 5,000 employees spread across North America, the Caribbean, and South America. We're licensed in all 50 states and every province and territory in Canada, and we have offices in Puerto Rico as well as Brazil. The Health Healthcare Solutions business segment <clears throat> has many sales and service experts to connect with partner and partner with our clients. In this partnership, we can uh, best understand your goals, uh, your objectives and challenges to help develop solutions addressing the complex and changing needs <clears throat> of healthcare institutions and healthcare professionals. Uh, additional information on hub healthcare products and services can be found at www.healthcare.hubinternational.com. The Hub's Risk Service Division has many risk consulting professionals spread across our geographic, geographic footprint that's already been mentioned. Our division supports our brokerage operations, and we provide an array of products and services to help our clients identify risks and implement the best, uh, best controls to reduce losses. Our team's credentials include board-certified and degreed safety and claims, uh, risk management security, property, and environmental professionals. We average over 20 years of practical experience, not the least uh, of which being in the healthcare industries. We also have an extensive uh, resources available through our partnerships with uh, specialty vendors. I've already introduced myself, but CNA Insurance has provided their expertise for this presentation. From CNA's healthcare unit, we have with us Ken Macy and Bill Rennie. Ken and Bill specialize in property protection and more specifically equipment breakdown regarding critical healthcare equipment and systems. A short bio on each. Ken Macy has 35 years of experience in safety and risk control. He's currently working out of CNA's Boston, Massachusetts office. He provides property, property and casualty risk control services to CNA's healthcare customers, including both hospitals and long-term care facilities. Phil Rennie is an equipment breakdown specialist and is a national board commissioned inspector. He has many years of experience developing risk mitigation strategies as well as completing regulatory inspections and claims investigations for a broad range of healthcare organizations. <clears throat> there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar, and we will be providing <coughs> excuse me, additional resources and contact information at that time. We'll also be providing copies of this uh, presentation uh, to all those who have registered for the webinar, as well as uh, posting the presentation for future viewing and playback on Hub's uh, website. At this time, I will turn our presentation over to uh, Bill Rennie, Bill, take it away. Thanks, Jim. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being on the call with us today. We have a lot of information to go over, so uh, I hope someone can, uh, people can take, it, take information away from it. Uh, I'm going to jump right into the equipment breakdown exposures. We have hot water and steam systems, which would be your boilers, cooling and climate control systems, which would be chillers and the HVAC units, electrical systems in life critical emergency power, medical diagnostic equipment, uh, your MRIs, your CAT scans, your PET scans, um, your IT rooms and equipment, and cold storage, refrigeration, and freezers. Start off here with your hot water and steam systems. Um, hot water and steam systems play an integral role at medical facilities. Boilers are used to heat water for hot water and steam systems. The hot water and steam systems are used for comfort heating, sterilization, sanitation, as well as many other uses. High pressure boilers are commonly found in central heating plants and are classified by the type of construction. Uh, you have water tube boilers, fire tube boilers, um, smaller units will be cast iron. Um, you have high and low pressure units. Uh, high pressure steam is anything over 15 PSI 
and anything over 160 PSI of water will be considered high pressure as well. Um, typically, you won't see any high pressure water systems. Temperatures are usually in degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, capacities of boilers will be in horsepower, pounds per hour, or if you have a smaller electric unit, it will be in kilowatts. Typical fuels used will include natural gas, oil, propane, and uh, not typically, um, but sometimes you'll find biomass boilers which will burn fuel or trash uh, or a combination. The picture here is a um, fire tube, three pass high pressure boiler. Um, this is a typical boiler you'll find at a hospital or a medical facility. Preventative maintenance program is a program designed to properly maintain equipment for safety, efficiency, and longevity. Based on the original manufacturer's specifications and the operating history, acceptable standards and best practices are utilized to come out with a common maintenance program. Methods and frequency include visual inspection and maintenance testing, routine service and cleaning, um, adjusting, major overhauls, and component replacement. On the routine side of things, you have the observation. Um, you want to check temperatures and pressures, water levels, um, just the overall condition of the boilers. You want to make sure the piping is safe, there's no steam leaks, and the safeties and controls look like they're in proper working condition. You'll have your routine checks as well as routine duties. Um, blow down boilers. The low water cutoff needs to be blown down on a routine basis. Safety valves should be tested on a routine basis. Annual inspections include internal and external inspections. An internal inspection on a boiler consists of draining the boiler. The water side of the boiler will be inspected for scale buildup, blistering, pitting, and overall structural integrity. Um, preventing and reducing scale buildup will improve efficiency. Um, so kind of a common known fact that a 16th inch of scale on the water side of a, of a boiler will decrease the boiler efficiency 13%. The more scale, the less efficient the boilers will be. A quarter inch of scale on the boiler tubes will decrease the efficiency 38%. The scale ultimately causes poor heat transfer and could result in boiler failure. Corrosion, scale, and carrier over are controlled by a water treatment program. You insert chemicals into the boiler and do proper blowdowns on the boiler and all the impurities should be blown out. The fire side inspection is a visual inspection for soot, bulging, warping, overheating, and overall condition of the fire side of the unit. Um, you want to check for any cracks in the refractory, any cracks on the tube sheet, um, improper combustion, um, excess um, blue gas, um, signs of leaking in, in stack exhaust. The low water cutoff should be taken apart and all external piping should be inspected um, visually. Here at CNA, our risk control department consists of 80, uh, 68 National Board Certified Inspectors. CNA is responsible for over 40,000 boiler and pressure vessel inspections per year. Safety devices on steam systems. Um, safety relief valves are maintained on all boilers and steam systems to prevent the units from overpressurizing. They are rated in pounds per hour in pounds per square inch. Pounds per square inch will be the set pressure rating and the capacity rating will be your pounds per hour. Um, if you look at the picture, you have a nameplate there, and you will have an ASME and national board stamping on the safety valve. Um, all valves in the U.S. jurisdictions are required to be stamped ASME and national board. Um, safety valve testing. Safety valve testing must com be completed when the boiler is at a pressure of 75% of the rated setting on the safety valve. High pressure boiler safety valves are fully open or fully closed. They're called pop type safeties. You pull the tri-level to the fully open position and the safety should 
fully open, and then once the pressure drops, it should fully close. If the steam leaks by, you know you have a faulty safety valve, and the safety valve should be replaced. Good engineering practices would dictate that every four to five years, um, high-pressure safety valves should be replaced. If any adverse conditions are noted or during a test as a condition that is noted, they should be replaced sooner. Uh, it's always good to have spare safety valves on site. If you do a test on a safety valve and it isn't properly receipt, it takes minimal time to replace the safety valve if you have a spare unit on site. This picture here, uh, the picture to the left shows a fully assembled low water cutoff. Uh, it's a cross-sectional view. As you can see, the water level in the what's supposed to be the boiler is lower than the float assembly. Um, the float is actually being blocked by debris. You have sediment also in the line, which is not allowing the water level to drop. Um, these are a few cases where the low water cutoff will not operate properly and can result in a a failure of the boiler. To the left, we have a cavitated low water cutoff float. Um, somehow the boiler became vacuum and cavitated the float. All boilers have a low water cutoff. The boiler's low water cutoff will be located at the proper operating level uh, for the water. The low water cutoff will shut down the boiler prior to the water level dropping below the lowest permissible water level. Um, that is the main objective of the low water cutoff. When the low water cutoff drops below that given level, it should kick off the fuel source, being the burner, and the boiler should shut down, not allowing um, combustion and the level to keep going lower. This is what can happen when a boiler doesn't properly shut down. The most severe boiler explosions are the result of a low water condition. The water level in the boiler will drop, the boiler will keep running, and when water enters the boiler, it will flash into steam. Water expands 1,600 times volume when it flashes into steam. This turns the boiler into a bomb. As you can see, this boiler uh, had a low water condition and uh, that's the result. It's, it's not a good situation. Boiler operators in most jurisdictions are required to hold a boiler operator's license or a, um, they're also known as stationary engineer's license in order to operate a boiler. Um, in the event of a failure, rental boilers are typically brought into a facility and can be connected to the steam supply um, header and within 48 to 72 hours, the facility can be back up running with, with full steam load. Um, if if the, there is redundancy, typically you'll want to design a boiler room with redundancy. Two smaller boilers is always better than one large boiler. Now we'll talk a little bit about the air conditioning and climate control. <clears throat> Picture shows a uh, package type centrifugal chiller. This is a common unit to most medical facilities with a central cooling plant. Uh, it's probably a two to three ton unit. Uh, air conditioning plays an integral role at medical institutions. Patient comfort is a, uh, a critical item at a healthcare facility, and these chillers will provide the comfort cooling. Air conditioning works by the removal of heat from a selected medium, such as air or water. AC is used to control the temperature and humidity of selected spaces. You might have your air conditioning uh, system piped into the operating room, uh, waiting room, IT room, computer room, um, office spaces, or other spaces that will require climate control. AC systems vary in capability and application. Um, typical AC systems are classified in the type of compressor that, that operates them. You'll have the temperatures that they produce and the tonnage, um, the BTUs that they, they put out. AC systems will utilize small cooling towers or condensers. They might also have indirect systems, which will feed uh, brine solution or another medium 
into a um, cold storage or, or, or a different location dependent on what it's being used for. The larger units are in central heating pl uh, cooling plants, while smaller units are typically package units, which will be on the roof. Um, these are common for IT rooms, uh, emergency rooms, kitchens, where you need a dedicated cold storage unit. Common compressor types are reciprocating, centrifugal, and screw type units. The maintenance on a chiller system may include daily and weekly uh, inspections. You want to monitor the temperatures and pressures. The semi-annual oil and oil filter changes. And then the annual maintenance, uh, eddy current testing on the tubes, refrigerant analysis, oil analysis, vibration analysis, calibration. Um, you may want to change out your refrigerant filter. Um, Cleaning of all the condensers and evaporators um, should be an annual thing, if not a monthly thing. You want to remove all the debris, make sure everything's structurally sound. Every five years, you might have a complete overhaul, depending on how often the unit runs. You look at your compressor journal, journal, compressor journal and thrust bearings, the drive gears, the seals, and always the safety relief or the rupture disc. You never want the system to overpressurize. Different equipment requires different service. Getting some electrical system stuff. We have uh, the picture to the left shows a set of step-up transformers. Um, this looks like a series of transformers which is feeding a local utility, probably a small production um, facility of some kind. Picture on the right. So the package type emergency generator, probably a three or four hundred kilowatt unit. Um, this will be a common size found at a medical facility. Uh, you may have one, two, three. You may have four or five of these units connected. Um, these could be internal to the building, or they could be package units which are located outside of the building. <clears throat> the electrical system itself. Um, electrical power distribution, it's run by cables and wires and distribution bus. It's run in overhead trays and underground cable. The electrical distribution includes central power distribution circuits, branch circuits, small transformers, um, step-down units, typically uh, 480 volt down to 208 or 120, and small, smaller localized distribution panels. Main transformers will be liquid-filled uh, liquid oil-cooled units, which are typically outside. Some of the other units will be dry-type units, air-cooled, which will be found typically inside. And then you have the bucket-type pole-mounted units. Safety and emergency power can be provided by a number of different sources. We just talked about the most common diesel generator. Um, that was in the prior picture. You could also have a steam turbine, which operates in conjunction with the steam boilers. And in some cases, you might also have a gas turbine feeding a steam turbine, which then feeds a generator. Poor electrical maintenance is a major contributor to electrical equipment failure. Proper electrical maintenance is critical in assuring and the continued operation. Electrical equipment may operate for years without maintenance before failing. Some electrical failures are catastrophic and cause large equipment losses, and even sometimes larger business interruption losses. Um, so a key takeaway here is uh, electrical maintenance is important. The maintenance activities on an electrical system will typically include visual inspection, uh, exercising all the breakers no less than annually, testing of the underground cable, uh, typically at a, at a hospital or medical facility, uh, three to five year frequency, you'll want to do a, a mega testing. Um, there are other tests. Um, I have a high pot test listed as well. Uh, that's a destructive test, not typically recommended, uh, but a mega testing is a non-destructive test and uh, you'll ensure that the underground cable is in good operating condition. Your transformer oil testing 
on wet type transformers. You'll test for dielectric strength, fair ends, dissolved gases. What this will tell you is the properties of the insulating fluid and the transformer insulation paper. Um, you'll be able to see what gases are in the fluid. For example, acetylene. If you find acetylene in your transformer, that's a sign that you have internal arcing. That's bad. Um, that means that your transformer is potentially about to fail. Thermal imaging. IR testing identifies hot spots in systems due to elevated temperatures. Common causes for elevated temperatures would include corroded connections, loose connections, overloaded circuits, um, faulty equipment. The picture above here is an infrared picture, and it shows a loose connection in a disconnection panel. This condition here could result in far, uh, arcing, fire, or potential downstream equipment failure. Um, here's a little study done by the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. This was done a few years back. Um, they took the information obtained from a single insurance company over one year's time. The company had over 2,000 major electrical losses exceeding a total of $600 million. Of that, $185 million, or 31%, were transformer failures. A large, large percentage of, of failures due to transformers. Transformers are usually severely um, costly failures. Generators and electrical cables are just over 100 million each, and motors were at 57 million dollars. The causes of these losses included overloaded circuits, overheating, foreign objects, long-term deterioration, dirty power improper system designs, and the big one is the lack of maintenance. Again, electrical system failures can be catastrophic and can be cascading. This is actually the same picture, just a close-up here. I was told that a squirrel was in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, actually became part of the circuit. Uh, sending high voltage, I think it was 13.8, into a 120-volt panel, uh, the unit arc, and uh, whatever this panel happened to be feeding was shut down. This picture here is a electrical switchyard with a high-voltage transformer. Um, there was an explosion from an internal arcing. The fire is oil which is being burnt off. Typically, the oil will be internal to the transformer. Um, nothing should be catching on fire unless it's a <laughs> severely bad condition. Larger transformers can take several weeks or months to obtain. A written contingency plan or redundancy, um, for example, the emergency generator, will minimize the downtime of the facility. Um, another thing everybody should be aware of is PCBs. Um, if you have PCB filled transformer, um, that is hazardous material and requires special handling. If there's ever a leak or a fire such as this, um, OSHA and a lot of regulatory commissions will be um, involved. Business continuity planning. Um, make sure you check your voltages if you have a spare transformer or have um, special specialized voltages. It may lead to longer lead times, um, so just know your equipment. Emergency generators, the life safety power. Um, emergency power generation typically supplies power to lighting circuits, elevators, dedicated circuits, and life critical systems. Some electrical systems may incorporate a large generator or a few smaller generators. The life critical generators will typically supply three phase 60 cycle power, um, typically at 480 volt or less. Generators are typically run off diesel, natural gas, or pro propane. Um, again, you might have an emergency 
backup power supply, which involves a steam or gas turbine as well. It's important to have a written emergency action plan in place in the, in the event of a power failure. It needs to be updated and reviewed annually. The staff must be properly informed of the content and they must be trained on the tasks that they are assigned. If there's a plan in place and no one knows what they're supposed to be doing, the plan doesn't really help. Uh, one other item I'd like to add on that bill is that management should research and be familiar with the location of the fuel supply for the emergency power source. The weekly testing of the generator will use fuel requiring that the fuel supply be monitored and maintained at an adequate level. They should also review the potential for the fuel supply to become contaminated by water in a weather event that could send unexpected amounts of water from rain, runoff, flash flood, or tidal surges into the area where the fuel tank is located. Great point, Ken. Um, a little bit of maintenance on your generators. Uh, your generators should be run tested weekly, um, monthly, if weekly is not possible. Load tests should be done annually to make sure that the thing will op operate normal um, if it, if it was be, to be called into service. Routine maintenance should include the cleaning of the air filters and fuel filters, monitoring all system levels, the coolant, um, oil, things of that nature. OEM guidelines will really illustrate the oil specifications and uh, oil analysis. Oil analysis should be done annually to determine the internal operating conditions of the unit. Some of the larger units, you might want to do mega testing. Um, and if you have an older unit, sometimes it's good to uh, do a generator rewind if your mega test um, comes up faulty. Due to the units not being in operation that often, proper maintenance is critical. Failures of the generators may be due to lack of maintenance, internal component failure, or possible manufacturer defects. Talk about some cold storage. Um, cold storage refrigeration at medical facilities is sometimes overlooked. Looks like a common refrigerator or uh, freezer you may have at your house, but could uh, hold millions of dollars worth of worth of product or, um, in this case, blood banks, cultures, medication, uh, antibiotics, human organs, um, and sometimes R and D materials. The proper controls and alarms are critical. We need to make sure that these temperatures are maintained because if they were to rise in temperature, they could ultimately destroy the product. Freezers can range from ambient temperature to negative 80 degrees Celsius. Temperature alarms should be on all units, uh, visual and audible alarms. They should be connected to an off-site notifi notification system, which will prompt someone off-site in the event of a high or low alarm and or a power loss at the facility. Emergency action plans should be maintained. The action plans could include redundant systems, um, a, a spare freezer on site, for example. The freezer should be connected to an emergency generator. If you do lose power, the generator will supply the electricity to the, to the, uh, to the unit. And in some cases, you'll have a nitrogen system, which will be also used as um, coolant. Information technology, IT rooms, critical and confidential information should be protected from being lost. You should be backing up information off-site daily or weekly. If possible, uh, use dedicated circuits. Um, you, by using dedicated circuits, there's uh, less chance of electrical failure. Um, power conditioners, you should have a power conditioner at the incoming feed to the IT room. And again, emergency power supply or battery backup for proper shutdown of the equipment. IT rooms will typically be climate controlled. They'll have dedicated HVAC units with alarms. Um, no wet piping overhead. You never want steam pipes, water lines, sprinklers, or bathrooms to uh, 
to have a, a failure in be dropping water on, onto your electrical equipment. Yeah, with regard to that last point, Bill, um, and no wet overhead piping, management should be aware of the location of any water sources on the floor or floors above the server rooms or other rooms that might contain delicate electronic equipment. Many new construction projects are specifying a physical barrier similar to a rubber roof membrane, which is applied directly above the ceiling of these locations. In these instances, we also need to consider any sprinkler piping that is in or above the room. For protection of server rooms, we should consider wet pipe sprinkler alternatives such as FM200 or other clean agents, or possibly dry pipe valves, pre-action systems, or a combination of all of the above. Okay, thanks, Bill uh, and Ken. Um, so far, we've discussed a, a broad range of uh, facilities, HVAC equipment, electrical, emergency generation systems, as well as some about the uh, your IT equipment. Um, <clears throat> obviously, no facility can afford to be without these systems, without downgrading the operational environment and the environment of care affecting patient safety. Um, and as described, good inspection testing and maintenance practices will help to prevent <clears throat> the loss of these systems. And then a good contingency planning consideration um, will help, you know, for any loss of any piece of equipment or system will certainly ensure the minimal or controlled impact on your operations from that loss. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ken Macy. He's going to be reviewing uh, sprinkler and fire suppression systems, and then we're going to move into a discussion of some surgical equipment and surgical fires and uh, medical diagnostic equipment. Uh, take it away, Ken. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the previous slide was a nice segue into our discussion on sprinkler system inspection, testing, and maintenance, also known as ITM. At a minimum, all sprinkler systems should receive ITM at least once per year. Twice per year is, per year is better, and qu quarterly is the best. All healthcare facilities are required to maintain proper ITM documentation. Here are some key issues with inspection, testing, and maintenance of sprinkler systems. Some of the things that we find out in the field are that the system has not been properly tested within the time frames, or the testing has been incomplete or improper, or more commonly that the lack of documentation um, leads to improper review and corrective action and on any deficiencies that may have been noted. Uh, here are some basic components for a sprinkler system. Uh, first thing you will need is a dependable water source, either a private source from a pond or an underground tank or an above ground tank or more commonly a public water supply. And this would be the piping from the main in the street into the riser within the building. And I'll be going over some of these terms in a few moments. Most systems include an alarm valve or a control valve and a means to test the equipment. The, the equipment that most people are familiar with is the sprinkler piping overhead or buried in the ceiling and the actual automatic sprinkler heads that you can see in your occupancy. This is a photo of a wet pipe sprinkler system. It, the pipe, the larger pipe on the bottom is the six inch, which comes from the underground from the street, which we spoke of. And then you have two separate wet pipe risers. Those are the four inch lines perpendicular to the six inch main. About halfway up, these four-inch lines, you'll see two sprinkler alarm valves. This is where the dials and gauges are. Um, when the system activates, a flapper within those alarm valves will open, sending the central station alarm to the fire department or alarm company so that they can respond. This photograph is of a dry pipe sprinkler system is very similar in appearance to a wet pipe sprinkler system with, where you see the alarm valve about halfway up above the black section spool piece of piping. That is the dry valve. From the dry valve below, we have water. From the dry valve above, the system is filled with air. 
This provides a delay in the water reaching the fire once the sprinkler head is fused. This type of a valve is used in a pre-action system, which allows you more time uh, in the event of a false alarm to get in and shut the water supply down, prohibiting water damage to delicate electronic equipment. Uh, there are several misconceptions concerning sprinkler systems, and I'll just go over those quickly. Um, if one sprinkler operates, every sprinkler op operates, that is not true, and on a system that you would see typically in a healthcare facility or hospital. Sprinklers do not operate when they're exposed to smoke. Sprinklers, when properly maintained, are not prone to leakage or inadvertent operation, and uh, manual pull stations do not activate the sprinklers. Again, we see the importance of inspection, testing, and maintenance of sprinkler systems. Draw your attention to bullet three, where improper inspection, testing, and maintenance can lead to component failure and possibly a fire due to an improperly shut valve or partially closed valves, pump failure, failure to start, or power shutdown concerning the fire pump. And finally, shut valves prevent the extinguishment of fire by any water-based suppression systems. This is known as an impairment, and whenever sprinkler valves are shut for more than four hours, you should notify both the fire department and your insurance carrier. This is typically for large-scale maintenance on the system. Automatic sprinkler inspections can be done by in-house employees to some degree. You should also be aware of storage heights in areas such as linen storage or even record storage. You must maintain at least 18 inches of distance from the top of the storage to the sprinkler heads for the proper, proper sprinkler water spray patterns to occur. You should also be able to inspect your fire department connections these are uh, pipes that extend through the exterior wall of the building where the fire department could come and pipe in or pump in auxiliary water from their trucks or from hydrants. These should have tightly secured caps on them to prevent children or vandals from placing objects such as cans, soda cans, into these connections, rendering them inoperative. Here is an example of a sprinkler head uh, experiencing com some corrosion. Uh, this is in a hydrotherapy room. Uh, it's probably using a chlorinated uh, cleaning system for the water. The, the sprinkler head has corrosion on it from that. Anytime a sprinkler head has corrosion or other alteration on it, it will not operate as designed. Most sprinkler heads in healthcare facilities and hospitals are designed to fuse or operate at between 155 and 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Any alteration, corrosion, or damage to the head will change that temperature, uh, reducing the effectiveness of the sprinkler system. In corrosive environments, you should consider the use of stainless steel heads, wax over polyester heads, Teflon heads, wax coated, or polyester sprinkler heads and you can find out about these from your sprinkler contractor. This photograph shows two fire pumps. Fire pump on the left is an electric fire pump. Fire pump on the right is a diesel fire pump. You want to be sure that the emergency generator that you have, which we talked about earlier, has the capability of powering your electric fire pump. If your healthcare facility has a fire pump, it is because the water pressure in your area is not adequate to supply the demand of your sprinkler system. The fire pump actually boosts the pressure of the system. Fire pumps also require inspection, testing, and maintenance. The electric fire pump should be run once a month for approximately 20 minutes with no flow. The diesel fire pump should be run weekly, again with no flow, for approximately 20 to 30 minutes. Your sprinkler contractor or fire pump maintenance contractor can train a member of your staff to conduct this important test.
Most healthcare facilities have cooking facilities similar to the one shown here. Cooking fires are the number one cause of fires, excuse me, cooking are the num is the number one cause of fires in healthcare facilities. All commercial cooking wet chemical extinguishing systems have a remote manual activation switch, which is very similar to this one. The kitchen staff must be trained on when to activate the system manually. The system will operate automatically with fusible links located in the duct and hood area of the exhaust system. But there is an, uh, an opportunity for the kitchen staff to manually operate the system to prevent spread of the grease fire up into the duct and hood, and they should be trained on this. This slide shows a typical cooking system, which is the gray portion of the diagram on the lower right. The red piping is the fuel source, and the electronics from the fuel source into the wet chemical extinguishing system, and the black piping from the bottle on the left shows the piping and nozzle uh, locations to dispense the wet chemical. Should be noted that this is a one-shot extinguishing attempt. If there is a fire and the system is activated manually or from the fusible links in the hood, once the contents of that bottle has been expended, there is no more uh, wet chemical capabilities for this. And if the fire is not fully extinguished or controlled, you will then be relying on your sprinkler system. This, these systems also have a solenoid. If you see the solid red on the bottom left next to the cooking equipment on the fuel source, that is the solenoid which will shut down the fuel source when the system is activated. These systems should be inspected, tested, and maintained by a qualified contractor every six months. And they will typically hang a tag on the manual activation switch indicating those dates, so check those. In this section, we'll be dealing with surgical fires. This slide uh, will give you the definition between a surgical fire and an oper operating room fire. Basically, a surgical fire is a fire that occurs around a patient who is undergoing a medical or surgical uh, procedure. As you can see, surgical room fires do occur. These are the numbers from the FDA and from the NFPA. This slide represents the classic fire triangle. Uh, you cannot have a fire without these three components, oxygen, ignition source, and fuel. Uh, this is the fire tetrahedron. This was introduced with the introduction of Halon 1301. Halon 1301 is no longer available. It, it, is a clean, it was a clean agent used in uh, sensitive areas for fire suppression is no longer available, but other clean agents such as FM200 are now available. Clean agents break the chemical reaction within a fire. Here are, we see all the components of the fire are present in a surgical room. In addition to ambient oxygen levels, we have the potential for higher levels of oxygen, so we have a higher hazard. Electrical surgical units, ESUs, and lasers can act as ignition sources and drapes, gels, and hair can add to the fuel load. Oxygen levels at 23% represent an increased fire hazard. Levels above 30% significantly increase the fire hazard, and as this slide shows, an increase in oxygen leads to a large, fast fire. Here is how an oxygen-enriched environment impacts the surgical room fire. Ease of ignition is enhanced. The existing fire now spreads faster and ignites any combustibles in the area. And we must execute care in, to control the oxygen to the lowest point required. From the fire tetrahedron, here is a review of some additional ignition sources. Some of these sources can produce heat in the range of 1,300 to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit which is sufficient to ignite our combustible fuel supply. An oxygen-enriched environment will increase the ease of ignition. Healthcare management must conduct a surgical room risk assessment. This slide will provide you with some guidance and understanding of risk 
to allow the development of a risk assessment method. Most healthcare operations that perform surgical procedures have a briefing, review, and assessment for clinical risk assessment. Management should promote adding fire risk assessment to the existing procedures. Here are some options to consider to reduce fire risk. Talk about the oxygen, the ESU equipment, not altering equipment, and not introducing any additional combustibles into the fire area. Some additional steps involving lasers and other ignition sources. One of the keys is to pre-plan through risk assessment, assign team responsibility, and understand and manage the fire fundamentals. There are some surgical room ignition sources. All of these have sufficient amount of energy to create heat or spark to ignite combustibles. This slide shows our surgical room fuel. Here are some examples of surgical room materials that can burn, particularly drapes, gowns, towels. Healthcare facilities should be providing training and incident review programs relative to surgical room fires. Incident review and evaluation of near misses can provide management with information for risk assessment and the development of emergency procedures. Take a look at what is in your healthcare facility's written plan on dealing with emergencies. You need to know if everyone is trained on the plan. Generally, the surgeon will direct any evacuation. However, all team members should know the plan and know what to do. Thanks, Ken. That was a uh, lot of good information. <clears throat> I'm going to get into the meat and potatoes of the medical equipment. Um, today's medical facilities use advanced diagnostic equipment to diagnose medical conditions and outline proper treatment strategies. Here are a few examples of equipment. You have your CAT scans, MRIs, PET scans, um, the ro robotic surgery equipment, uh, the cardiac telemetry systems. Proper operation of these systems could mean the difference between life and death. Diseases such as cancer often require early detection for survival. Without proper operation of the medical machinery, a patient can go undetected. The results of going undetected could be critical illness or sometimes even death. The equipment we have listed here is all expensive, precision, and life critical machinery. Most of this equipment is found at your local hospital. Um, exposures, all me mechanical and electronic devices are subject to failure. They have complex systems. Current systems are designed with features intended to minimize the potential for harmful effects, such as failures on patients. System redundancy, system alerting, alerting sorry, will prompt bad conditions and correct, corrective action. Dedicated circuits should be utilized for all medical equipment. Dedicated circuits are direct lines set up for the equipment. They don't necessarily run through common lines or electrical panels. It's less likely that, likely that a dedicated circuit will be overloaded. Uninterrupted power supplies, UPS systems, should be utilized at all medical facilities. They're slightly different from an emergency generator, where a UPS system will have a battery backup which will allow the emergency generator to come online so there are no glitches in the system. Power conditioners should be utilized as well. Power conditioners clean the AC power and eliminate interferences on the power lines. You will commonly find a power conditioner at the main feed of all medical facilities. Um, we have a couple of common issues that we've seen with the medical equipment. Power outage, um, if your facility loses power, medical equipment goes down. Sometimes it will be due to a tripped breaker. 
You want to make sure that all dedicated circuits, all the breakers are properly functioning and in the on position. Image artifacts, lines and grainliness, um, typically related to wear and tear. It's a sure sign of lack of maintenance or periodic inspections are due. To catch a potential problem before it gets bad enough to affect the quality, um, typically you can make repairs during slow periods instead of um, a failure during the busiest time of the, of the year. Low helium levels on MRI units are common. It's important to monitor your helium levels. Most MRI service contracts will cover a magnet quench due to negligence. Uh, I believe helium levels are supposed to be around 70%. Anything uh, in the 50% and under is uh, critical to get more helium into the system. Uh, a quenched MRI magnet could result in uh, magnet failure and millions of dollars in repair costs and downtime. This picture shown is an electro electrical failure to a PLC. Unlike the boiler and the transformer, it's not a catastrophic failure, but could lead to long down periods. It's a robotic surgery machine here. As you can see, leadership management and training is critical when dealing with life safety equipment. Standard operating procedures should be developed and include testing and inspection procedures, preventative and predictive maintenance procedures, emergency action plans, maintenance and documentation, documentation programs, and employee training. All are important when trying to minimize loss potential and improve patient safety. Without establishing these common procedures and completing these routine activities, you could experience premature failure, reduced performance, OSHA fines, higher maintenance costs, customer complaints, poor reputation of your facility. You never want to be the facility on the front page of the paper for something tragic that happened. It could have been prevented. A uh, key takeaway from today should be that knowledge of equipment and exposures and the impact of operations is critical to properly managing the exposure. With this knowledge, we can properly institute risk control measures to protect your employees, your patients, and your reputation. This slide shows some additional uh, source classes offered by CNA. Source is our School of Risk Control Excellence, and these are all specific for the healthcare industry, emerging life safety issues, security, OSHA primer for ambulatory healthcare, Healthcare emergency planning and healthcare risk managers need to know what are the emerging and evolving risks. There is also one on basic electrical exposure and risk control and boiler maintenance and upkeep. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, the next slide that's up here now is just the uh, contact information for myself, Ken, and Bill. Um, the information provided in this uh, was kind of extensive, and we ran through it very quickly. Uh, healthcare organizations will sustain equipment breakdown events at some point in their existence. Um, hopefully, the information that was discussed in today in the presentation, uh, you'll be better prepared to identify, you know, the potential gaps in your current practices and implement solutions to uh, reduce risk to your organization. So, both from a pre- and post-loss scenario, good inspection, testing, and maintenance procedures and contingency plans are going to figure greatly in keeping critical equipment and systems online and mitigating the impact of a loss of that equipment or system. Um, we at the Hub, the Risk Services Division at Hub, are certainly uh, available to help you uh, um, review any of these issues with you if you would like. If you are a CNA customer, uh, that is available to you as well. Um, <clears throat> I am going to put the last slide on here, which is the, uh, some upcoming uh, Hub webinars that you can review, but we are going to open this up to uh, questions at this point if we have any questions from our, from our listening audience. Operator, can I turn it back to you for uh, questions? If you would like to participate in the interactive question and answer session, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request and a prompt to record your name. 
If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star, then the number two. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, please press star one. At this time, there are no questions. Okay. Well, again, we're going to thank you for uh, attending the presentation today on equipment breakdown. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact uh, uh, myself, uh, Ken, or Bill, and we will help you out as best we can. Um, our contact information is on the, on the slides. Uh, a copy of this presentation will be made available to you um, in the near future, and it will be posted on the Hub website for uh, uh, future uh, viewing and playback. So again, I thank you for participating today, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's conference. You may now disconnect. Presenters, please hold the line.